Welcome to Connect Canyons, a podcast sponsored by Canyon School District. This is a show about what we teach, how we teach, and why. We get up close and personal with some of the people who make our schools great. Students, teachers, principals, parents, and more. We meet national experts too. Learning is about making connections. So connect with us. National Overdose Awareness Day is August 31st. So today we're speaking to Jen Gerard, the school nurse specialist for Canyon School District. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me. It's kind of a dark topic, and it's one of those things that you don't want to think about your loved ones or especially school age having to deal with overdose, but it really is a problem. Um, What would you say is something that parents should be looking at in regards to overdose within school age kids or Um, even their family because let's be honest it touches all aspects of our lives for sure yeah it could be any one of your loved ones that could have an overdose situation and they can come from lots of different sources right there's opioids in a lot of very uh, various um forms so there's the prescription opioids that you take when you have surgery or some kind of a pain situation If people take more than they're prescribed or more than they're supposed to, that could result in an overdose situation. There are um, the illicit drugs that we're finding on the streets that contain substances like fentanyl um, that could easily become an overdose situation. So first, I mean, obviously we want to recognize the signs that somebody is using drugs or medication, whether that's prescription or not, and be aware of what could happen. Be aware of the signs of an overdose. So that's going to cause um, unconsciousness a lot of the times, so and most of the time they're going, to re- they're going to become unconscious because their respiratory rate decreases so much that they're not getting enough oxygen to their brain, and so they're unconscious. Uh, pinpoint pupils, so if you flip somebody's eyelids open, you can see that their pupil is very, very small. It's, it's very much like at the point of a pen, um, but but really that shallow, ineffective breathing is ultimately the biggest problem, the biggest concern. It puts them in almost like a coma situation, um, and they're just not breathing well enough to perfuse their body with oxygen. So so would you recommend that every household have the, is it a Narcon? Narcan? Narcan is a, yeah, Naloxone is a generic name. Narcan is the, um, the product that comes in the quick and easy nasal administration. I don't know that every household needs it, but if you know that somebody could potentially have an overdose situation, if you know that somebody has a history of using medications or drugs, whether it be prescription or illicit, um, then I think that it's beneficial to have that on hand. And I know a few years ago, you were able to pick it up at the library. There were lots of places where you can get it. Can you? Okay. And that's going to be in an injectable form. Usually they're giving the kind that you have to uh, draw into a syringe and inject into the muscle in the in the leg usually is where that's administered. If you know that somebody has a history of using drugs, any kind of drugs, even if it's not an opioid, if somebody has a history of, let's say, cocaine addiction, and they have a history of overdosing on that, where they get some of the opposite symptoms where they're having tachycardia or whatever, they're still at risk for an opioid overdose because they're at risk for using different kind of drug. Same thing with prescription pain pills. We'll have people that are managing their pain okay with prescription pain pills. It gets to a point where it's not managing it well, so they start taking more. It's harder to get prescriptions now. Then they can turn to illicit substances such as heroin to kind of manage that pain. Um, and heroin and fentanyl are both drugs that are very easily overdosed on because of the concentration of the opioid in them. Our reversal agent of naloxone or Narcan is really effective for opioids, but it's not effective if that drug is mixed with something else. And unfortunately, we're seeing a lot of mixed drugs. So if you have a Xanax, for example, Narcan isn't going to do anything for that. So if you take a whole bunch of Xanax and you overdose on that, Narcan isn't going to be what saves you. It's a different reversal agent that you would need. So it's only specific to opioids, and it's going to it's going to work to basically block all those opioid receptors in the body. So Xanax, that's the benzo. Yep, that's a benzodiazepine. So those different don't. Different kind of drug, different reversal agent. <laughs> so that's kind of a scary thing it when you're looking thing. into like helping. Because I've, I've had friends who have suggested having um, – the shot within your first aid kit just because, but like as a, not a trained professional, I don't know that I'd want to be just going around having a shot, not knowing people's histories. Yeah. So the, the good thing about Narcan is it's not going to hurt you. So it's a super safe drug. Naloxone is a really safe drug. And if you give it to somebody and it's not what they need or it doesn't work, um, it's just not going to work. It's not going to hurt them in any other way. It's going to block all of their opioid receptors in their body so that they can't absorb any opioids. But if there's no opioids in in the system, it's not going to help them. It's the same thing with all of our rescue drugs. They're all really, really safe to give to somebody just in case that wasn't really the problem. Sometimes it's hard to tell. There's lots of things that mimic each other, right? 
So, I mean, any rescue drug is pretty safe to administer. They might have some side effects or some symptoms related to it, but they're not going to be fatal. So what are, I know that there's an issue with opioids in particular that when people get them, they think that they can also take things like Tylenol and things like that, but they don't realize that like when you've had, say you've gone to and had a root canal mm -hmm. and you're prescribed something that you don't realize that that prescription actually has Tylenol in it. Right. And then when you go ahead and take over Tylenol the counter too. stuff and yeah. you start, you know, self-prescribing like, hey, I'm going to help myself out by taking Tylenol and Advil on top of it, you're actually could be doing damage and have an overdose of another kind, For not sure. a full. What would you suggest to people? Like, what are some guidelines when um, when you're taking medication? Because I think people are really afraid of opioids. Oh, I can't speak. But you're afraid of when you're prescribed things at this point. I know I am. Every right. time I've been prescribed something, I'm almost afraid to take it. And I almost... Which like is just, unfortunate, yeah. right? Because pain medications were invented for a reason, and yeah. they do a lot to control pain under the certain or the right circumstances when you need them. So if you're post surgery, it's okay to take your pain medication. That's okay. But we've we've gone to the opposite extreme, and now we're like so anti pain medication. But there are some surgical procedures. There's a lot of procedures that Tylenol alone isn't going to be enough to alleviate the pain. And when you're in a lot of pain, it's really hard to heal and recover, right? So having pain management is still really important. There just has to be a balance. And if you're taking your pain management as prescribed and you're only using it as long as you need to, then it's relatively safe. So the threat of addiction, I mean, there's obviously other other variables that can make addiction more likely for some people. If you have a history of addiction in your family, if you have addictive traits yourself within your your brain, your own brain. So there are some people that are just more susceptible to becoming addicted. But usually, generally speaking, if they're taking out, taken as prescribed for the reason that they're intended, that's pretty safe. It's these people that go into um, these chronic pain situations and then it's not well controlled. And so the people that say it started with a prescription, it's usually because the prescription was there for pain. It's not that anybody goes, not many people go to the doctor and they're like, hey, I just really wanna try these narcotics. So can you get it, my shoulder's kind of bothering me. Like it usually is a true issue of pain that they get the prescription in the first place. Um, those medications are mixed with other drugs. So uh, Percocet is one that's oxycodone and Tylenol. So if you're taking a Percocet specifically, you shouldn't take any Tylenol until you're off the Percocet instead of combining them because then you're gonna get an overdose of Tylenol in your system, which causes issues with your kidney, your kidney function. Well, and I think a lot of times because we have overcorrected, people don't realize that um, that too can lead to an overdose in the sense that then you get behind the pain. Yeah. And then some people, because they're behind the pain, decide, oh, I'm going to take more of the stuff I prescribed at right. this time instead of staying at, like, I was supposed to take a pill at this time and then a couple hours later and then they take two at a time or, and it messes and up the schedule. The whole domino effect, it's yeah. true. And that's, that's certainly something to consider. It's really hard to control pain when you're in pain. If you get ahead of it before you're in a crazy amount of pain, so we always use a pain rating scale from zero to 10, right? 10 being the worst pain imaginable and zero being no pain. So if your pain tolerance, if you're pretty uncomfortable at a five or a six, that's probably when it's time to take your medication, as, assuming that it's been enough hours. Um, if your tolerance is a seven or an eight, then you wait till you get to a seven and eight. If your tolerance is a three, then we probably need to try some breathing exercises and some other things to kind of get that anxiety part under control, which can also compound the feeling of pain. So fentanyl is really becoming a crisis. Is is it? That's not really something that's prescribed very much, though, is it? Is that that's more something that we're finding laced in other drugs, mm -hmm. correct? Yes. So fentanyl is a great um, analgesic, which is a pain reliever, essentially. And it's used therapeutically in clinics and hospitals. Um, it's not something that's generally prescribed to send home. I don't think it's ever prescribed to send home, actually. Um, we're finding an illicit form of fentanyl that's coming into things. And so... Primarily, the U.S. is getting most of their fentanyl from Mexico. It is laced into other drugs unknowingly. Um, it's mimicking drugs unknowingly. So uh, there, there's the new uh, counterfeit M30 blue pills that are that traditionally would be an oxycodone. Um, it's now only fentanyl that drug dealers are selling. So there's also Adderall that's laced with fentanyl that's coming out of Mexico as of recently. They've been finding a lot of that. And that's really scary, especially with the Adderall shortage. I mean, everybody has a friend that goes to Mexico to get a bunch of antibiotics to get them through the whole year, which is unnecessary for lots of reasons. But 
you know, it's scary because if you think there's an Adderall shortage and then people in your family need Adderall for their ADHD to treat like the true symptoms that they're having, um, they've got somebody going to Mexico, hey, pick me up some Adderall while you're there. Well, you don't know, re- you don't know what's in it. And that, I think, is the most alarming thing. I mean, it's not as safe to do drugs today as it was 20 years ago. And 20 years ago, it wasn't safe. And so that's really alarming to think that these kids, essentially, or even adults, right, it's, it's most common. Fentanyl overdose is most common between, like, 25 and 34 is the, the most common age. But they could be thinking that they're taking an oxycodone, and they're not. They're taking something that's loaded with fentanyl. And these aren't chemists that are making these pills. I mean, sometimes they are, but most of the time they're not. Um, they're working uh, with cartels. They're transporting chemicals in from overseas, and they're making fentanyl out of it. And then they're putting that into a pill form, and they're calling it the same thing that it would have been. So they call them the blues or M30, blue M30 pills, and then they're selling them on the streets, and they're not expensive compared to some of the other drugs that we can buy. Um, and so, sadly, people think they might be taking a Percocet or they might be taking an oxycodone, and they're actually getting something else. There's also um, THC vaporizers that are laced with fentanyl. DAB is commonly laced with fentanyl, and those are drugs that kids access all the time, and that's alarming because they don't know what they're getting. So it's not the same as going to buy a little bit of marijuana from your neighborhood drug dealer. I mean, even a little bit of marijuana could be laced with something. Fentanyl is lethal at a very small dose. Um, It's not a lot of, well, a therapeutic dose is 100 micrograms. Um, And I listened to a mom tell a story about her son that had overdosed because he thought he took a Percocet and he, it wasn't, it was fentanyl. It was a blue M30 pill and it was fentanyl. He had eight and a half milligrams of fentanyl in his system when they did his autopsy. Two milligrams is lethal. 100 micrograms is a therapeutic dose. Two milligrams, that's 20 patients. And he had eight and a half milligrams of fentanyl in his, in his bloodstream. Like, that's, that's a wild amount of narcotic on board. And his respiratory system essentially just shut down. It just put him into a coma, and he died. So, again, going back to it, it's a really dark subject. It really is. But the, the reality is, is that, I mean, there's preventative measures we can take. Establishing relationships, maintaining relationships, being involved, being aware, checking in with your kids, talking about the safety and the risks of drugs and <clears throat> what's out there. My kids, I think I drive them crazy because I'm always telling them all the bad stories because I, I don't want to necessarily cause fear, but I also want them to know just how dangerous it is that just using somebody's vaporizer pen isn't necessarily, you're not getting what you think you're getting all the time. And that is alarming. And drug dealers are lacing things with fentanyl because they want to create the better high. They want their, their people to buy their drugs because they're better. They do better things for them. But if you're, pay, if you're, customers are dying, then you don't have any anymore. True. Well, and the scary thing, too, is I think a lot of these things can come about in an innocent way is if somebody thinks that they have a Percocet, and so often people think they're being helpful when they share their drugs of, like, I have a prescription for lower tab and you're in pain, let me give you a lower tab. Or, and that's something as parents that we should be really careful about of teaching our kids that, hey, prescriptions aren't meant to be shared because you don't know if they got it from Mexico or That's first true. of all, they should never be shared. They should never be shared regardless of where it came from. But yeah. Yeah. So yet another way that we need to be clear with our children that like we don't share any of that. And yeah, that's definitely a really good message. Um, not, not sharing your medications, even over the counter medication. Like it's really just best if you take your own items that you bought from the store, your parents bought from the store so that you know exactly what's in them. Um, What is the rule within the district? Isn't there a rule that, like, if kids do have a prescription or even over-the-counter that they aren't supposed to actually take it? That's a sidetrack thing. But at at school, what's the rule with medications? Well, so in our medication policy, and which is directly following the state laws, so students in secondary schools are able to carry up to a 12-hour uh, dose of any medication that they need, whether that's prescription or over the counter, except narcotics. So if they have a prescription pain medication, they cannot self carry that. If it's something that they need during school, which would be unique because if you need narcotic pain medication, generally you're still at home recovering from whatever that was. If there were a weird situation where that was appropriate, that the child was able to function at school or the student was able to function at school um, and take that, then it would need to be done through the office and administered by somebody else. I don't think it ever happens. I don't think we ever have that because, like I said, kids generally are at home while they're recovering and still needing those pain medication, and they need to be able to come to school and function and be safe. And so if we can't confirm that that's going to happen, then the nurse is not going to sign off on that medication order anyway. So they're not allowed to carry anything narcotic. Um, 
that said, like Adderall is a controlled substance, but it's not narcotic. So they can carry up to a 12-hour dose of their Adderall if they need that for ADHD in secondary schools. In elementary schools, everything has to have a medication order that's signed by the prescriber and by the parent and by the school nurse. So for any medication, even the ones that they're allowed to self-carry, like the asthma inhalers, the EpiPens, those are protected and allowed to self-carry if needed. But if they're in elementary school, they still have to have the medication order. So anything else we would be administering in the office. Do our schools have Narcan? All shots. of our schools have Narcan. We all have the nasal Narcan spray, so it's really easy to administer. Our nurses train people in each building to be able to recognize and respond and treat if needed if they suspect an opioid overdose. So even in our elementary school, where it's less likely, but again, we don't know what the kids are getting. They don't know what they're taking. You just They innocently try things. I mean, I heard a story over the weekend of a preschool student that brought a pipe to school um, and called it a whistle and was sharing it with her friends, sharing her whistle. So I, anyway, you just never know. It could come about innocently, even at a young age. But there's more people in the building than just those students, too. So even in our elementary schools, we have Narcan. It could be a parent. It could be a teacher. It could be anybody that had an issue, and we would be able to help them. Um, our elementary schools have two doses of Narcan, which could treat one person, essentially. Two, you could give one dose, but oftentimes you need a second dose, depending on how much medication is in their, their system or how active it still is. So you could need another a repeat dose after 15 or 20 minutes because they still have a belly full of pills, right? Um, in our secondary schools, we have four doses in each of them. I would love to have more just in case. We haven't across the state last, not this past school year, but the year before, there's an annual report that goes out from nurses that talks about the number of medications that are administered for, for emergency situations. And we didn't have any Narcan administered that year. I don't know what this past year is until that report comes out, but for the whole state. So we've got 31 districts that have Narcan uh, policies and they have Narcan in their buildings, but we didn't have to administer any of it. So that's that's Thank awesome heavens. news. Yeah, yeah, we're really we're really excited about that. But as we watch some of these larger states battle their drug issues and the fentanyl issues, and as it moves around, we know that Utah's always just a little bit behind some of the bigger states. And so it's concerning to me to hear school districts in Texas having to administer a lot of Narcan, and I feel like we're just like, it's headed our way. There's been um, a handful of reports in the news of fentanyl pills that were confiscated recently from different drug dealers, um, 63,000 pills beginning of June from somebody in Magna. And then we had another, uh, well, they said 25 pounds, which is essentially like 115,000 doses that was just confiscated on July 5th. So was that yesterday, the day before? Um, from somebody that was driving in Utah County, and it was just a, a traffic stop. And they found a bunch of these M30 pills that, with intent to distribute. So it's right here surrounding us in Salt Lake Valley, and it's only a matter of time before that's in a lot of hands. So once again, um, what should our parents be looking for and <laughs> warning our kids? Like, what are our warnings that we should be you I mentioned. think that it's a good idea to talk about drugs with your kids. It's kind of one of those faux pas conversations that people don't want to have, and they assume because they're good kids they're not doing it. But we don't really know what our kids are doing, and, and we do know that kids are sneaky. So I think that it's important to talk about all drugs, talk about the vaporizers, talk about the fact that things are laced with other substances that they may not know what it is. So you think you're getting one thing, but you're actually getting something else. I think it's important to have that scary conversation with those kids so that they just have somebody telling them. And it may not be make the difference, right? Just a conversation might not change my teenager's mind, but I hope that it will. I hope that our overall relationship is good enough that they'll listen to me and maybe think twice and pause or get out of the situation if something's presented to them. So I think that having those healthy conversations with your relationships with your kids is super important. And then, you know, they say loving them, but really like loving them and being involved in their life and knowing what's going on um, in their environment and with their friends and who they're hanging out with and what they're doing. And what are the signs of an overdose, particularly op opioid? Oh. Why is that word so hard for me to say? <laughs> it's a little bit of a tongue twister with lots of different letters. Um, yeah, so opioid overdose is, I mean, traditionally, like, they're unconscious. They are, their respirations are really shallow. Like, they're not, they're either not breathing at all or they're, they're really shallow and they're very few. So they're decreased respirations, so decreased breathing. Um, and then if you, if you found somebody, I mean, they might be, like, over salivating, those kinds of things. You can flip their eyelids, look at their pupils. Their pupils will be very, very small if they have any narcotic on board, um, and that would be an indication. So if, obviously, anytime you find somebody that's unconscious and barely breathing, we always call 911, but call 911, 
be prepared to respond. If you suspect that you are living with someone or you know someone that has a history of drug use, it's important to probably have some Narcan in your house, or whether that's the generic naloxone form of an injectable um, or the Narcan at nasal spray. But a pharmacist would be willing to teach you how to use it if you needed help. There's lots of resources. Your school nurse in any school that you're would be willing to teach you how to use naloxone or Narcan, either one. So there's lots of ways that we can protect these people with response too. I mean, there's pre prevention is great, but response is also necessary sometimes. And so knowing what to watch for, recognizing that like, oh my gosh, this person is barely breathing. Their pupils are really small. I think they probably have a lot of um, Narcan, or excuse me, narcotic on board, which would be like the opioids. Because I would assume that like the faster that you respond, the quicker that you can um, save well, brain function and yeah, stuff. Yeah, they're, exactly. Their survival rates increase substantially. It's the same with any rescue thing that we do, whether it's CPR or naloxone or whatever. The sooner we react, the sooner we respond, the sooner we get those reversal drugs in their system to stop that opioid from continuing to cause that respiratory depression. Their lung function is going to come back and they're going to start breathing well again, which is then going to get oxygen to the rest of their body. And as far as drug storage within your own home, what what do you suggest? Um, anything that's narcotic that could be dangerous in that regard, it really should be locked up. There's there's lots of ways to lock up drugs in little containers, whether that's just a simple little padlock, keeping them locked up or keeping them in a place where they're not accessible to anybody that's young or doesn't know how to use them. <clears throat> that's important, um, keeping your medication safe and then disposing of them. A lot of people will get a prescription for pain medication. They don't need it all during the time after their surgery. So they hang on to those 10 Percocet or 10 Lortab in case they ever need it for any kind of pain that comes about in the future. When you're finished with that prescription at the time for the reason that you were prescribed it, you really should discard it, take it to a pharmacy, put it in one of their drop boxes, discard it, uh, dispose of it safely, right? We don't wanna flush it down the toilet or throw it in the garbage. Um, but all pharmacies I, now, I believe, have a lockbox that you can go and drop your medications in when they're expired or when you no longer need them. But ultimately, hanging on to those prescriptions and for future use, you know, the whole doomsday thing, thought process, you're then prescribing something for yourself. It's no longer for the intended purpose, and it really should be disposed of as soon as you're finished with that need. If you don't need it anymore, just get rid of it. It's not worth keeping it in your house. It could be an unsafe situation for lots of reasons, right? If it's not your child accidentally getting into it, it could be somebody comes into the house and knows that it's there, and they take it on purpose, knowing that they want it, that they're seeking those drugs. So disposing of your medications, keeping them in a safe, secure location when you're storing them is always important. But that's that's also true of, you know, over-the-counter supplements as well. Like, we don't want anybody getting into a whole bottle of Tylenol if they don't know how to use Tylenol because that could cause some serious damage as well. Perfect. Thank you so much for joining us today and talking about, like, a, a difficult topic but keeping us calm and letting us know the yeah. things that we can do to watch out. Is there anything else that you would want to let us I think I, I, I think covered you did. all the high points. So Or the low points. Is. Yeah, low points is probably a better way to describe it. But yes, I, I feel like we covered it well. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. Thanks for listening to this episode of Connect Canyons. Connect with us on Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram at Canyons District or on our website, canyonsdistrict.org.